First came the earthquake. Within a minute of the earthquakes starting to occur, they would have started to experience violent shaking. Some of the instruments in the very sophisticated network in Japan show that these accelerations reached uh, two and uh, as a maximum three G. So you know, at one G, uh, anything over one G, your feet don't stay on the floor, you're, you're airborne. They were shaken very violently for a good three to six minutes. <laughs> Some buildings start to collapse. You'd see large structures that would start to sway around. Some people see the ground rolling. It's like the, the, the solid ground is, is rolling in a, like waves at the beach. Then came the waves. The earthquake happens off the coast of Sendai uh, on Friday afternoon about 2.45. The tsunami appears some 20 minutes later, something like that, depending on where you are. From the time the earthquake started until the arrival of the tsunami, you've probably got about 20 minutes, and you've already lost about 10 of them just through the shaking and trying to negotiate your way out of the building. I, that's what I would estimate. So you've got about 10 minutes now, and you've got a, in many cases, I think, these people had a long way to go. The meteorological agency has issued a tsunami warning for Japan's Pacific coast. People near the coast should evacuate immediately to higher ground. Many of those living along Japan's northeastern coastline didn't make it to higher ground. Everyone would have experienced waves at the beach, you know, yeah, a big wave might be two meters. It might knock you around for about 10 minutes and then retreat. This wave is, is 10 meters high and it keeps, it comes and it keeps coming and coming for 10 minutes. That's 600 seconds, 600 very long seconds. In the space of 10 fatal minutes, thousands of men, women and children were swept away to their deaths. People are just dispersed over many, many kilometers and they're stuck in these massive de debris fields. They're just totally inaccessible. There's no one, not going to be anyone around to hear them uh, and rescuers can't get to them even if they knew where they were. Thousands had lost their lives and half a million Japanese had lost their homes. The scale of this double disaster was beyond comprehension. But it wasn't just a double disaster. Less than two hours after the earthquake shook Japan and the tsunami flooded its coastline, the Tokyo Electric Power Company announced that four million households were now without power. On Japan's northeastern coast, the Fukushima Daiichi power station felt the full force of the earthquake, and its nuclear reactors automatically shut down. Regarding our nuclear power facilities, some of the nuclear power plants have stopped automatically, but so far, no radioactive material or radiation has been confirmed to have been leaked to the outside. 
we will secure the safety of the people of Japan. At Fukushima, what we have are six reactors. Three of them had already been turned down, but three of them were operating. And immediately, because of that earthquake on the first day, the three that were operating immediately auto shut down. They'd all shut down safely with a massive earthquake, which I think is a tribute to the way that the, the, the earthquake protection had been designed and operated. All the reactors shut down, all the control rods inserted. So at that stage, it, it was very good. But then came the tsunami, breaching the seawall, protecting the power station and flooding the standby diesel generators. Tony Owen is a former power station manager with 30 years experience operating nuclear reactors in the UK. Why did those generators fail? They got flooded in the tsunami. Um, it, it looks as if the station was designed to, to cope, you know, the station has a seawall, it's a coastal station, it has a substantial seawall, but it wasn't built high enough to cope with the, the level of tsunami they experienced. So that once it, it covered the seawall, then it would have covered the cooling water pump house, the diesels, the main switchboard, a lot of essential equipment. Within an hour, we have the massive tsunami that strikes. And what this does is it takes out all of the backup electrical generation. And this is incredibly important because when you have a nuclear reactor with irradiated nuclear fuel spent rods in a pond, both of those things must have active cooling. So we need electricity to run the pumps that get the water into both the reactors and the cooling ponds. So in a sense, we begin minute one with the earthquake, but we begin minute two, in a sense, with the tsunami taking out the backup power. And at this point, within as little as a day, we begin to have serious buildup of heat and gas in these three reactors that had been operating. Twenty-four hours after the earthquake struck Japan, the roof blew off Unit 1 at the Fukushima Daiichi power station. It was the first in a series of explosions at the plant. The images were shocking and unprecedented. The explosion of the outer building, which is not designed as a containment barrier, but nevertheless is a very solid structure with very thick concrete walls, appears to be associated with a, a high-pressure buildup of hydrogen gas that arises from the breakup of water molecules and water vapour. And I think that process is understood. Uh, but it, there's never been an incident that I'm aware of that the pressure has built up to such a point where it has detonated. The water inside of that reactor core begins to drop because the pump isn't running, pumping new water to cool it in, the water begins to become steam, superheated. And now what happens is that water level starts dropping. As it drops, what you begin to have is the buildup of hydrogen from the melting of the fuel elements. And this is an incredible thing right there, because as these fuel elements have melted in these three reactors, that's what we call a meltdown scenario. That is the beginning of a meltdown. But what it also does is it builds up hydrogen gas, which is hugely explosive. And that in turn leads at first to one reactor, which gives off enough gas that there's an explosion and that blows the top off of the reactor building. Radiation was now leaking from the plant. The radiation level rose to 21 microsievert temporarily. Something had to be done to keep the reactors cool. As a last-ditch measure, the decision was taken to pump seawater in to cool them down. If you were the manager of the plant and, and you were giving the order for seawater to be pumped in to cool the reactors, what would be going through your mind? I've just written off the plant. <laughs> so, I mean, in a way, this is a 40-year-old reactor. It was due to shut down very shortly, if, if not this year. But it'll give them all sorts of problems because they've now got seawater inside the reactor, which will cause, starts to cause corrosion problems. Once you begin to put seawater in a reactor, 
That reactor is no longer a nuclear reactor, it's a piece of goop, nuclear garbage. That reactor will never operate ever again. But the reason for that is that the salt water now in the reactor is corrosive and begins to eat away the steel from the reactor. Again, a terrible decision to make. Do we allow the reactor to heat up and potentially explode, or do we start pumping seawater into the reactor even though it destroys it as a reactor? As workers at the Fukushima plant battle to control the reactors, the Japanese Red Cross traveled 200 kilometers north. The scene that greeted them was one of utter devastation. Three days after the earthquake that shook Japan came the second explosion at Fukushima Daiichi power plant, this time in Unit 3. The next day came a third explosion, this time in Unit 2. The explosion appears not to have compromised the course of the buildings in which they occurred. So that's a good thing. Uh, but it's all relative. The explosions uh, were um, unanticipated, they are without precedent, and they reveal um, that the circumstances at um, Fukushima in particular are rather desperate. This is the primary container, is that right? Yes, so there's a very thick primary containment surrounding the reactor vessel itself, um, about 15 centimetres strong. At the bottom of that is this suppression pool, which is a a toroid of water. This shows better the, the reactor vessel inside the primary containment and the, the toroid suppression chamber at, at the bottom. It also shows the secondary containment, which is um, a secondary containment building, a ventilated building. But this is a fairly lightweight top on it, and, and this is the part that, that was blown off in the explosion. Several workers were injured in the explosions and others exposed to large doses of radiation. The major challenges are the staff in this sort of situation and managing dose rates. So when the staff go out to do operations, um, they'll carry a, a rate meter with them, which tells them the dose rate at that time. And it's also got an integrated feature which will tell them the total dose they're receiving. So. There's, there's limits on, on dose that you want to do. There's also the possibility in this sort of accident of airborne contamination. So they would normally go in a, a plastic suit with breathing apparatus to, to enter the, the, the sort of reactor areas. How big a protection are, are the protective suits that they wear? The protective suits are no protection against the gamma radiation, which is giving them the dose. The protective suits will protect them from fallout landing on their suit, uh, and it's mainly to stop the, the beta radiation, which would cause huge skin doses in, in the case of uh, it being deposited on the skin and staying there for a period of time. Um, but the protective suits and obviously the respiratory equipment is to stop you inhaling the material. Um, they, don't, they don't provide any uh, re restriction of the gamma radiation dose. On Tuesday and Wednesday last week, Following the third explosion at Unit 2 and two fires at Unit 4, extremely high levels of radiation were recorded at the plant. There have been reports that uh, uh, emergency crews in, I think, reactor number 4 yep. have been um, exposed to 400 millisieverts an hour. How serious is that? Well, 400 millisieverts is a, is a serious dose from an occupational point of view. The normal yearly rate is that's allowed is 20 millisieverts for routine operations and going up to 50 millisieverts in any one year um, if, uh, if that's necessary for some reason. In emergency situations, the International Commission on Radiological Protection recommends that um, planning should occur within the range of 
20 to 100 millisieverts, that, but that people shouldn't really receive 100 millisieverts in one event um, unless it's totally unavoidable to save life or to uh, save massive destruction of uh, equipment. How serious would those extremely high levels of radiation be for workers operating on the site? Well, it looks as if it only lasted for a very short time. Uh, certainly the one that was reported, which was 400 millisieverts an hour, which is a very high dose, um, seemed to be only for a short time. But they certainly have had to evacuate um, workers at, at various times because of the radiation levels. The concern being expressed was that a core group of workers still on site, working in shifts of 50, could develop acute radiation sickness. If these crews are working there for hours on end, how bad could that be? Well, I believe the 400 millisieverts lasted for a short period of time as there was a release from Reactor 4, um, but so that it didn't continue at that level for a long period of time. But, but if you worked for several hours um, at that level, then you would get to big doses of one sievert or above, which would start to cause acute radiation syndrome and you'd have... Uh, you know, nausea, vomiting, um, and these sort of effects and leading to reddening of the skin, hair falling out, and, and, and also um, compromising your immune system. The terrible situation in the devastated area, it deeply saddens my heart. As the horror toll of lives lost in the tsunami continued to rise, there was growing alarm within and outside Japan over the fate of Fukushima's nuclear reactors. I am deeply anxious that the situation at the nuclear plant is critical, and I wish all concerned in their endeavour to solve the problem every success. We're unfortunately kind of maybe only at the middle of this terrible catastrophe and nowhere near the end. We still have a situation where those three reactors are continuing to heat, the fuel is continuing potentially to melt, and it's not at all clear that they've got any kind of real control over the cooling. Damon Moglen is director of Friends of the Earth's Climate and Energy Project. For more than a decade, he ran Greenpeace International's plutonium campaign and spent a year in Japan focusing on nuclear issues. Last week, in common with other anti-nuclear activists, he expressed great alarm at the challenges facing workers at the plant. That third reactor, where we had an explosion, is the first reactor of its type at that area in Japan to have plutonium fuel loaded into it. And that raises a huge additional specter of both troubles for controlling the reactor, but also for radioactive releases. Because the plutonium is highly radiotoxic. A speck of plutonium inhaled into the human lung is very likely to cause fatal lung cancer 18, 20 years down the line. And it's a radioactive pollutant in our environment for tens of thousands of years. So the problem there is, if that plutonium fuel is melting inside the core, if it's being vented out, or if an explosion were to break the containment open, we could have, and we have as much as a quarter of a ton of additional plutonium in that reactor, we could have radioactive releases containing plutonium, which would be just yet another horror to have to deal with. Richard Bronowski is a former diplomat who was posted to Tokyo in the 1960s and has written a book on Australia's nuclear industry. He too is alarmed by the challenges faced at Fukushima. I'm particularly worried about unit number four where you've got, where you've got a, a massive number more of the spent fuel rods in the so-called swimming pool keeping them cool than are in the reactor. Now, what's happened is the water has lowered in that, exposing those rods. They've built up their heat and they seem to be damaged too. And the next stage would be a meltdown. In Unit 4 last week, water covering hundreds of nuclear fuel assemblies was falling dangerously low. Spent fuel is highly radioactive. In order to keep it stable, it's submerged in cooling ponds. 
That's one of the, the classic images of the nuclear industry. One is the, the reactor dome and the other is that cobalt blue swimming pool with the eerie light. Um, those spent fuel rods are high level radioactive waste. The problem area now is the spent fuel ponds and particularly Unit 4. Unit 4 was shut down in November, so at the time of, of the accident it was in a shutdown state. But because it was shut down for maintenance, one of the actions they'd done was to remove all the fuel out of the core and put it into the spent fuel pond, which is in the secretary containment at a high level in the building. So there was a full core, that's 548 fuel assemblies were in that spent fuel core. And because the reactor was operating up to November, they still got significant decay heat. How much spent fuel are we talking about here? Uh, the full core load for, for a unit four um, would be about 98 tonnes of uranium. So it's a substantial quantity. That sounds quite alarming. Well, it obviously is of absolute priority to, to keep that cool. We believe at this point that Unit 4 may have lost a significant inventory, if not, uh, if not lost all of its water. And that Unit 3 is in danger? Uh, well, I would say it, what we know at Unit 3 is that there is possibly, a, again, and our information is is limited, so we, we do, what we believe is that there is a crack uh, in the spent fuel pool for Unit 3 as well, which could lead to a, a loss of, of water in that pool. As the crisis escalated, the head of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission delivered a pessimistic report to Congress. The same day, military helicopters were brought in to start spraying the plant with water. By now, more than 200,000 people had been evacuated from a 20-kilometer zone around Fukushima. But some remained stranded inside the exclusion zone. We weren't told when the first reactor exploded. We only heard about it on TV. The government doesn't tell us anything. We're isolated. They're leaving us to die. It's not just the government which has faced fierce criticism. The disaster at Fukushima has hit the Tokyo Electric Power Company hard. This commercial boasts that 40% of Tokyo's electricity comes from the Fukushima and Niigata power stations. But the company has had a checkered history. One of the, the major crises was uh, occurred between uh, 2002 and 2003, uh, when it was discovered that for a number of years, about 16 years or so, uh, the industry, which uh, the company which is currently in the limelight, namely the Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, concealed inspection data, okay, uh, and they falsified uh, air pressure readings in the containment buildings. Obviously, when you think about it from the current perspective, these are serious issues because cracks in reactor shrouds indicate that radioactivity could potentially escape if there's enough radioactive buildup. TEPCO's safety measures now have a hollow ring. No radioactivity can leak to the outside, the company says of its plants. All designs provide margins of safety capable of withstanding even natural disasters. At Fukushima, the 40-year-old plant did not survive the tsunami, which flooded and wrecked the backup generators. Is that a major design failing at that plant? Well, this is where the modern plants such as the AP-1000, that's the, the Westinghouse plant that's being built in China, has got a completely passive cooling systems, all contained within the containment, totally independent of any outside supplies. So the, the modern design of reactor would have coped with this sort of emergency, even this extreme emergency. The Fukushima disaster has intensified the debate between those who argue that new technology will make the nuclear industry safe 
and those who point to a long history of nuclear accidents at Windscale in the UK, Three Mile Island in the US and Chernobyl in the Ukraine as evidence that the industry is unsafe. When something goes wrong, we're told, well, that reactor, that, that reactor's problem was it was a Soviet reactor. That reactor's problem was that it was an old reactor. That reactor's problem was that it was next to a river, not the sea. Every reactor, when they go wrong, has a reason to explain it. But uh, the overarching message from industry is it's all fine, it's all good. Now, you can't have it both ways. I feel uh, an immense sadness and uh, I feel anger that that this industry has been allowed to develop as far as it has uh, without as many checks and balances as it should have. One can understand the Japanese desire for autonomy in everything, including power. But I think there's a mafia, just as there is in France, just as there in South, is in South Korea, just as there was in Russia, uh, to some extent in Britain, of, of secrecy held together by a nuclear priesthood. And the priesthood says, look, trust us, we know. That secrecy is now being challenged. In Tokyo last week, a rare nuclear industry whistleblower stood up in public to declare his concerns. Dr. Masashi Goto designed containment vessels for nuclear reactors before resigning over safety concerns. In an interview with Four Corners, Dr. Goto criticized his country's record on nuclear safety. We have the government commission overseeing nuclear safety standards, and in my opinion, they are not doing their job. Dr. Goto says the Fukushima disaster shows Japan has not yet learned the lessons of history. At Three Mile Island, the nuclear fuel melted. Fuel is melting here now. We have to design reactors to withstand melting fuel rods. Right now, the reactor will break down due to the heat generated by the melting rods. And he claims that profits take precedence over safety. No one says it officially or openly. When setting standards for future earthquakes, the thought is of money. How much is it going to cost? This underlies the government's decision making. They're thinking the costs could have bad repercussions for the economy. That's what I think. Few deny that the Fukushima disaster will hit the industry hard. And in Australia, that will be felt by the miners and exporters of uranium. Australia's mines contain 40% of the world's uranium reserves and produce around 20% of the world's supply, amassing close to a billion dollars in export earnings. Japan uh, takes, takes about uh, a fifth or a sixth of our uranium and we supply about 20 or 22% of theirs. Was Australia's uranium being used at Fukushima? Um, look, I, it's, I think the, uh, Australia's uranium companies export to, uh, uh, export to Japan um, and it's, uh, they're, they're, they have commercial and confidence contracts with the companies in Japan. Um, so they don't reveal uh, the utilities to whom they export, um, but they will have exported to, uh, uh, to that company uh, from time to time and uh, probably will do so in the future. On the face of it, at least, the uranium industry is maintaining a positive outlook. How damaging will it be to the nuclear industry worldwide? I think that the, uh, the factors which were driving the growth in the nuclear power industry last Friday are the same factors which are driving the growth in the nuclear power industry today. How much damage has this event done to the nuclear industry? Oh, I think a great deal of damage. Uh, the nuclear industry has, I would say over time, uh, worked as well as it has uh, because of people's confidence in the integrity of reactors and acceptance that many of the issues associated with the management of spent fuel and waste were properly handled. But we've always understood, and we saw this happen in Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, that if, if the, that community trust is uh, breached, 
uh, by whatever development, it'll take a long, long time to recover it. So I think this is, uh, as Chancellor Merkel in Japan, uh, in Germany, described earlier in the week, uh, a turning point for the industry. Japan supplies about 90% of its energy needs from outside resources. In relation While it may be a turning point for the industry globally, there are those who believe that Japan will double the number of its reactors by 2050. Given that, you know, uh, this Daiichi uh, plant is basically going to be written off. That means you're losing six reactors, six out of 55. That's over 10% of your nuclear power generation. So I think there, there will in fact be a, a, a push maybe to increase the pace at which we reconstruct nuclear power. For hundreds of thousands of ordinary Japanese, the past 11 days have been a cascading sequence of harrowing catastrophes. For a country that survived the atomic horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it is doubly painful. Their aim now is to struggle through their anguish and reconstruct their own lives. Personally, I feel a great sense of sorrow and empathy when you see those pictures of little kids having Geiger counters run over them. That might count what's on the outside. What it doesn't count is what's on the inside, what's been inhaled, what's been ingested, if any particles are sitting in a kid's lung or a kid's thyroid. Even now, the worst case scenario remains of a catastrophic meltdown at Fukushima's nuclear reactors and greater releases of radiation in the wider community. The job of preventing that lies with those inside the plant. Almost the fear is unnameable because, and I think this is the problem for the Japanese people, you really don't, you, you have a system which had great integrity, but it has failed. And uh, you really don't know where it could stop. The worst thing, obviously, is the equivalent of a dirty bomb of one of the reactors physically exploding and dispersing as uh, radioactive particles. These faceless men, uh, there might be a few women there, but mainly men, uh, are heroes. They're doing what they're told to do. They're following instructions. They're shortening the time that they're exposed to the radiation in their full suits. They bring them out, they hose them down, they wash them. Uh, then they go back in again. They're going to die. Uh, many of them, I think, are, are, are probably sacrificing their lives. The hope is that emergency crews can now regain control of the power station and pump enough water in to prevent a catastrophe. But for some of those brave men and women, it may already be too late. Individuals not only are valued for making sacrifices. Individuals are expected to make sacrifices. You know, we didn't have kamikazes in the West, okay? What is a kamikaze pilot except someone who sacrifices himself for the good of the nation? He is committing suicide for the greater good, okay? Hey! So I'm not surprised that we have individuals in this situation putting their lives at immediate risk because that is seen as part of the responsibility. There are huge stakes in play for the world's most powerful governments and for the nuclear power industry not to mention the public at large, as the full implications of the Fukushima nuclear crisis are becoming clearer. Resource-poor Japan itself now relies on the nuclear option for one-third of its power, 
a vital part of its economic lifeblood. And South Korea is even more reliant. China has a medium-term goal of 15% nuclear power. India is also on the nuclear road. And emerging countries like Vietnam and Indonesia are planning a partly nuclear future. America has more than 100 nuclear reactors, most of them three decades or more old. But after a long hiatus, America is now talking about more nuclear power, not less. Europe is heavily committed with 30% on average coming from nuclear. In France, it's nearly 80%. Meanwhile, the environmental movement remains largely anti-nuclear, despite the argument that nuclear has to be part of an effective solution to global warming. So there have been a lot of vitally interested spectators around the world watching this drama unfold. John Carlson is one of them. For 21 years, he headed the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office and chaired the International Atomic Energy Agency's advisory group on safeguards for five years. He's now a counsellor with the Washington-based Nuclear Threat Initiative and a visiting fellow with the Lowy Institute. I spoke with him from our Washington studio earlier today. John Carlson, what is your worst fear scenario related to civilian run or, or nuclear power plants run for civilian purposes? I think we've just about seen it, Kerry. Uh, uh, I, I can't imagine anything worse happening. Um, uh, people think back to the Chernobyl accident and uh, uh, a number of commentators were predicting that this would be like Chernobyl. Uh, the technologies are just so different and um, the driver for uh, releasing large amounts of radiation simply uh, isn't there with uh, light water reactors. Um, so I think basically we've seen the worst scenario and it's turned out to be not the nightmare that many people th thought it could be. Uh, that, that's certainly not to be complacent and clearly there's going to be a lot of work um, analysing uh, what happened and learning and, and improving safety systems. But, uh, but I think basically the technology has shown itself to be very robust. Really? You can say that? Robust? Uh, given the pictures we've seen, the explosions that took place? Well, you have to look at it in terms of uh, two things. Uh, first of all, what was the actual impact uh, on public safety? Uh, and, and secondly, I think in any kind of analysis we do of nuclear energy, we have to uh, compare it with other energy sources and the, the risks and benefits and limitations of other energy sources. I think if you look at nuclear energy purely in isolation, you'd probably conclude maybe it's best not to use it. But the fact is there's no perfect way of generating electricity and we have to take an objective look at pros and cons on a, on a comparative basis. Even if the environmental exposure to radiation turns out not to be serious in this case, Fukushima does still throw up significant questions, doesn't it? Not least the policing of standards at nuclear